Good evening. We're going we're gonna to move because we have a tight schedule this evening. My name is Paul Barrett. I'm the Dean of the College of Business and Economics here at Longwood University, one of the America's best business schools about to get better. I welcome you to the first of four executive and residence programs. We have a highly regarded CEO from a Fortune 500 company with us this evening, and some of us came from far and wide to hear him discuss what he has learned along his path to success. In this regard, I must let you know that we have quite a few dignitaries in the room this evening. So many dignitaries that I've made an executive decision that I will not ask them to stand and be recognized. The reason I'm doing this, I don't think it's practical. I think it would take a very long time. However, I have decided to simply recognize only the most important people present this evening. <laughs> so tonight I can tell you that we have an auditorium full of the most important people in higher education today. These people are the reason we are all here. They are the reason our guest speaker is here to talk to us. In fact, they are the reason we all have hope for the future, a future that will be brilliant, where excellence and leadership will transform society to a higher level beyond anything we have ever known or dreamed of so far. We have with us this evening, and I ask that you stand at this time, the students of Longwood University. Longwood Lancers, please stand. Thank you. <clears throat> Normally, the introduction of the executive guest speaker is done by the student group that also co-sponsors this event. But I have decided with an executive decision to usurp that privilege as well. OK, so now I have the distinct on honor to introduce our executive guest speaker. He is the president and chief executive officer of Frito-Lay North America. Frito-Lay is part of the PepsiCo family of businesses, and it is the most profitable operating division and the company's largest North American business. He was appointed to his position in the year 2006. Prior to this, he served as president of PepsiCo Sales, responsible for sales, customer management for retail, food service, and fountain businesses. In this role, he was the architect of PepsiCo's highly successful Power of One branding and cost divisional strategy, leveraging the strengths and capabilities of all of the Pepsi businesses under a unified approach to and in support of customers. Previously, he was Chief Operating Officer for PepsiCo Beverages and Foods. He also served as Senior Vice President of Sales and Retailer Strategies. And before this position, he served as Senior Vice President of Sales for Pepsi-Cola North America with responsibility for Pepsi sales organization, the fountain beverage division, and management of its bottler community. He joined Frito-Lay North America as director of trade development. He held a broad range of positions at Frito-Lay, including vice president of national sales, vice president general manager of food services, and division president of Frito-Lay West, and even as a chief operating officer before becoming its chief executive officer. Our executive and resident speaker this evening is a member of the Board of Directors of Home Depot, the world's largest home improvement, improvement retailer. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Maryland and a member of the Dean's Advisory Council for the Smith School of Business, also at the University of Maryland. He is also on the Board of the Corporate Advisors to the National Council of La Raza and the Advisory Council of Portland State University Food Industry Leadership Program. He is married with four children and is considered by all who know him well to be a great family man and friend. But here is the Paul Harvey rest of the story. Here is the crux of what makes our speaker tonight so special and the authentic leader that he is. He is a living example of what Tom Peters called the revolution in leadership. Peters defined this revolution in his book, A Passion for Excellence, the leadership difference. The author described how he advocated a change from tough-mindedness to tenderness 
in leadership effectiveness. Tom Peters went on to introduce a paradox in that most leaders are trained to focus solely on hard data and balance sheets with little or no emphasis or concern for what Peters calls the soft stuff. The soft stuff, Peters said, includes values, vision, and integrity. And I quote the author who wrote, we have found that when it comes to achieving long-term success, soft is hard. And let me say that under our speaker, the Frito-Lay operation is nothing short of brutal. Brutal in the way that it protects and empowers its people. Extraordinary results happen all the time at Frito-Lay these days because the barriers to making great things happen have been simply cleared away. At Frito-Lay, people are trained and simultaneously empowered to own their own achievements. Our guest speaker tonight is the real deal. He is tough as nails and uncompromising about a value system that cares as much about people as it does profits. And he also leads from the paradox that caring about and respecting people is quite simply the best way to engineer profits. He is about to share the secrets of his soft is hard paradox of effectiveness. Having said this, I do suggest that all of us sit a little closer to the edge of our seats and listen carefully. I know that he is going to share some things tonight and we will hear them if we listen. Things that will change our lives and our organizations for the better. How do I know this? This speaker has been doing this for me personally ever since I first met him about 40 years ago. Please join me right now in welcoming Mr. Al Carey. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dean Barrett. I still have a very tough time <laughs> with that. <laughs> but uh, that was over-the-top introduction. I'm a potato chip salesman. That's basically what I do for a living. And that was a very nice introduction, but unnecessary. And uh, I'll tell you, the turnout here tonight is extraordinary. Um, I don't think, I think if I, at the corporate headquarters at Frito-Lay, if I told them I was giving a talk, I would not have gotten a good turnout like this. No, there's, there's no way. But I found out that, Benny, you're giving them credit for showing up here tonight. Is that right? <laughs> so I apologize to a couple of you. You may see a few slides that you, you saw this afternoon in the four sessions, but I'll try to make it a little different and mix it up. But I want to tell you about uh, the presentation I'd like to give tonight is uh, a real-world example of a practical business model that follows what Dean Barrett is trying to introduce into this university at Longwood. I think this whole notion of serving others is a very noble thing to do, and it's probably one of the best ways and innovative ways of, of changing the, the direction of a university or a company. And I'm really proud of my friend Paul, because over the years I've always thought he had some terrific, terrific people skills, but the notion of serving the student body here to make them believe in themselves so that they, they can become greater than maybe they even thought they could become is one of the coolest things I've seen. And it's something that we're trying to do at Frito-Lay. I wouldn't tell you that we're enormously successful yet, but we're working on it. But I think you'll see a very direct comparison to what's being taught here with the seven steps of leadership, with the speed of trust and the Covey model, and what we're trying to, you know, at Longwood and is what we're trying to do at Frito-Lay. So let me get started. And, uh, I'll give you a couple of the boring setup slides. Uh, here's uh, PepsiCo. We're a division of PepsiCo. Uh, PepsiCo is a $60 billion company, and it's the largest food and beverage company in North America and the second largest in the world. And the reason it got to this new stage is because we acquired our independent bottling system, the majority of them, and that made the entire business grow in revenues over the last year. We made this acquisition early in the year. Next is a couple of things about PepsiCo, and I won't bore you with all this, but I'll just tell you a couple of key things. Uh, we have about $107 billion in sales at retail, 18 brands that do more than $1 billion a year in sales. And I think that's the best of any consumer products goods company, even some of the, the big ones you've heard about. We're in 200 countries, 200,000 employees, and uh, the headquarters are in Purchase, New York, and uh, big company. Here are some of the brands. Some of them are very familiar to you, Pepsi, Mountain Dew. 
Frito-Lay's products like Lay's and Ruffles and Doritos, Sun Chips, but you're probably not that familiar with you know, Gatorade's one of ours, Tropicana, Quaker Oats, Starbucks, <clears throat> Frappuccino product we're a distributor of, and you can see Rice-A-Roni, Propel Waters, Aunt Jemima, Stacy's Pita Chips, you, you, you can see the whole list up here. It's a big portfolio. Now Frito-Lay is a, a $13 billion division of PepsiCo, and uh, we have 49,000 employees. You see the rest of the details on here. The thing I'm most proud of that makes us most different is that number on the bottom, 18,000 route salesmen. We have 18,000 18, salesmen that ride in their trucks every day, that get up early in the morning, like 3.30 in the morning, get fresh product on the truck, deliver to the stores every single day, and I'm proud of that team. They're one of the greatest sales forces in the world. And they're the ones that we've built the company on their backs. And there are some of the brands, and I won't go into a great amount of detail on this. I think those of you who are students are saying, please, no more of the slides. I've seen them all this afternoon and rather move on. So here's what I want to talk to you about. Like you're trying to develop a servant leadership model at this university, we're trying to build a servant leadership model at Frito-Lay. We're trying to serve our employees and our customers and the environment and also humans by providing healthier foods. So here's a slide. And I love this slide because it's a one-page strategy review. And when we developed this, I said, I want one slide that I can stand up in front of 500 people in a plant and give them a presentation off of one slide, and it's very simple to understand. And I'm not going to go through great detail on this because some of the students have heard this maybe two or three times today. But uh, we came up with this uh, group that was a very eclectic group. When I first got to Frito four years ago, we brought a group together, my senior team, invited in people like Deepak Chopra, my former chairman of our company. Uh, we brought in Wayne Dyer. Uh, we brought in uh, Stephen M. R. Covey, Jr. And we also had Dr. Dean Ornish, who's the world-renowned uh, heart specialist. And we had a couple of days of thinking about our business and where we would want to take this company as the leaders over the next five years. And I think all of us felt that we were known as a junk food company, and we were not proud of that. We also knew that we were not good for the environment and that we had 20,000 route trucks that got nine miles per gallon. And if you look in, the, in the, uh, the way we managed our people, I would say we were a little bit more of the command and control organization where a couple of people at the top kind of decided what we were going to do and then they shoved it down into the organization. When I took over the job, I knew that wasn't for me. I had no interest in managing an organization that was like that. So when I took the job, I asked permission that I'd be able to help transform this organization, not alone, but with a team. And we were able to do that. And we came up with this one bullet point, which is inspire well-being, is what our vision is for Frito-Lay. Now, it seems like quite a lofty goal for a snack food company, but I'll take you through some of the components of it. And I'll tell you what, simply what we're trying to do. Number one, under healthy products, we are not going to be the junk food company in three years. I will guarantee you that we will have changed every single product we make, make the product healthy, change the ingredients, and still make them taste good. Second, no more arrogance with our customers. We are going to listen to our customers. We're going to call on them regularly, and the best salespeople are the best listeners. And I'm trying to enforce that in my team. The best salesmen are not the people that talk the most, even though some of us grew up thinking that. But I can tell you right now that when you listen to your customers is the way you figure out how to solve their problems, and that's the way you make sales. Third, the environment. We are going to be the best green company there is, not just in the snack food business, not just in the food business, but in any business. And finally, the one I love the most is this one on inspiring greatness in our people, this fourth one. I think that the role of leadership in an organization is to inspire the masses so they can perform at levels greater than they ever thought they could perform at and make great performers great, but take average performers and turn them into great too. And so you'll see some of that when I get into the details. This is our vision, and I think we're on the road. I wouldn't say that we've succeeded yet, but I am very proud of where our team has taken this so far. So let's take a look at the first one. This is, let's call it healthy snacking. How do you change the portfolio? And I'm going to give you a little more detail than I did in, in the, the classroom this afternoon. But um, you've heard plenty about the obesity epidemic and health and wellness in the last couple of years. And I think for a food company to close their ears to this and stick your head in the sand and think that this is not an issue. Obesity in children is an issue. And it's not going away anytime soon. 
This is going to be something that stays with us for a very long time. When you have a, a large portion of young people today, at 12 years old, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, this is an issue. And the obesity in children today is a problem. And food companies like ours have got to deal with this issue. For us to say that the obesity in children is a result of video games and sitting in front of a computer, it may be partially true, but that's not going to work. We have got to change our products in a way that makes them healthier and that people are willing to try and, and families feel good about giving those products to their kids. So we started a journey not that long ago of taking the fats, the bad fats, out of our product. And I'd say the biggest violator we had five or six years ago was trans fats. Everybody, I think, now knows what a trans fat is. It's the most unhealthy fat there can be. Clogs your arteries. There's all kinds of evidence that it causes heart disease. And so we had to get the trans fats out. So a little story. Dr. Ken Cooper from the Cooper Clinic in Dallas one time met with us. We hired him as a consultant for a while, and Dean Ornish. And they sat in a room with us and they said, you know, you guys have got to get the trans fats out of your products. And I got to be honest with you, everyone in the room that was there really didn't know exactly what a trans fat was. Our head of R&D kind of understood it, but we didn't know what the issues were with trans fats. About two weeks later, after a full investigation, we eliminated all of the trans fats in our product and took a $50 million charge in that year to make sure that we got the trans fats out. We thought it was the right thing to do, and it was the only thing to do. Since then, we have still taken down more and more of the bad fats. And I'll tell you that in this month right here, or it might be October, we are putting canola oil in our products and blending it with corn and, and sunflower oil. And it gets you the best possible combination of saturated fats. So this is a hard chart to read. But if you take a look at the very top line, and the green is saturated fat. And you can see all the way down here, coconut oil, palm, palm oil, lard, partially hydrogenated oils have got very high levels of, of the dangerous saturated fats. And if you look at canola oil at the very top, it's the best oil there is out there for saturated fats. So effective in about a month, all of our products will have one gram of saturated fat or less in the, in the product servings. So I think that's a breakthrough. And it's something that has cost us a little bit of money, but I'm betting on the fact that consumers will eventually know this and will be rewarded for it. And I'll tell you, young mothers know what saturated fat is, and they're very aware of what they're feeding their young children. And saturated fats is one of those items on the list that they're not going to compromise on. Then you take a look at sodium. That's the next thing. If you take a look at sodium, here are some of the comments from big companies around America on what they're going to do about sodium. I don't think there's even an argument anymore that we've got to get sodium out of our products, all food companies. Most consumers have no idea how much uh, sodium is in the average serving of their product. So here are some comments. Some of them are weak. Some of them are pretty impressive. Uh, the fact that Kraft will take 15% uh, sodium out of their turkey lunch meat and 10% out of their crackers by 2012 is not impressive, in my opinion. If you look at some of these others, 20% uh, reduction in 80% of the products for ConAgra, that's their effort. Campbell's Soup, 24% sodium reduction in the top selling products since 2001. That's a pretty impressive. Uh, Kellogg, 75% reduction of sodium over 20 years. Excuse me, that's a little weak. 20 years from now, I hope we can do a little better than that at Frito-Lay. Just to give you a perspective on sodium, I believe in the next couple of years, maybe three, you'll probably see uh, not legislation perhaps, but significant pressure on food companies to reduce sodium. In fact, the FDA has now defined the new guidelines for a, a daily requirement or a daily safe diet would be taking it from 2,500 milligrams of sodium, which is the recommendation today, down to 1,500. Well, consider what you're eating and turn over the back of those packages. You'd be surprised at how fast you can get to 1,500, uh, college students especially. I mean, you, there's lots of sodium. I don't know that it's as big an issue with college students as it is with baby boomers like myself, but lots of people are being told by their physicians, reduce your sodium and reduce it by a lot because it is a source of hypertension and other diseases. So let me just show you this. Here are our products over here on the right. We have everything from about 180, 160 milligrams of sodium per serving. And we even have a product where we, we took out half the sodium in our products just to see what would happen. They don't taste as good, but we took half the sodium out. Products are flying. 
and the product taste is not as good. I'll come back to that in a minute. But 150 to 180 milligrams of sodium in our product is a lot lower than you would expect because we're called salty snacks. I wish we can go back 70 years ago and change the name from salty snacks to something else. But take a look at what other things are out there. And you probably can't read these. Lasagna with meat sauce, frozen, 930 milligrams per serving. How about tomato soup, 710? The one that surprised me, a bagel, a plain small bagel, 370 milligrams of sodium, three times what we have. Look down the list, a glass of milk is 110. That's a good goal for us to get to, 110 or below. Now you look over here at some of the famous, um, famous items that you might find in fast food restaurants and you have the, let's go to the bottom, Panera Bread, which is a very popular, in quotes, healthy kind of a place. Get a broccoli cheddar soup for 1,020 milligrams of sodium. Go all the way up on the list to uh, P.F. Chang's chicken lo mein, almost 3,000 sodium. That's more than a day's worth of sodium in one salad. And if I went to P.F. Chang's to have a salad, I'd feel like I was doing something good, right? It's a salad instead of a burger, a salad instead of something else. You would have been better off having a McDonald's Big Mac. It's only 1,040. This is a mystery to a lot of people, but if sodium is gonna be looked at seriously, we're gonna to have to understand it better, and it's in a lot of product and in higher levels than you think. So what are we doing? Starting in now, right about now, and running through the middle of next year, we'll take 25% of the sodium out of our products, starting with the potato chip business, which is the largest part of our portfolio. Inside of two years, we'll remove 25% of the sodium out of everything we make, and our R&D team was awesome in the way they figured out how to do this because the taste does not change. And if you look at this little diagram up here, that's an electron microscope actually looking at sodium granules on the surface of a potato chip. Who said you don't need high science? This, who said this wasn't rocket science in selling potato chips? But look at that little diagram up there. What we basically found out is some of the little parts of sodium, the little granules of sodium, fit below the surface of the potato chip in the oil and no one ever tastes it. So we figured out how to extract those out of the process and only put the bigger sodium granules on the product and we were able to take 25% out. So it was really a remarkable thing. It's not easy to do that. It costed a lot of money. Now our next step is to take that step to another level and we found that if you take a sodium granule, which is dense, and make it more hollow, you could take 40% of the sodium out and not affect the taste. Now I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this because I told you I was a potato chip salesman. I am not sophisticated enough to take you through the whole process that we're doing, but we have produced this product in the lab, and now we have to scale it up so that we could use it in, in uh, big scale production. But 40% of the sodium now takes you down to 100 or 110 milligrams of sodium, which is how much is in a glass of milk. So I'm very proud of our R&D team. And what it tells me is you could take young, smart people that are in that R&D shop, and you point them to the goal line, and you empower them with uh, the ability to go get their job done and look what they've accomplished. They would have never done this if we didn't give them some rope to go try some different things. And it's an exciting time at Frito-Lay. Our people are very proud of this work. And if you go out in the plants and the young people who are out there are sending me emails, we love this. We are really proud of what's going on at Frito-Lay today. So here's the plan. Between 2010 and 2013, we will reduce the sodium on every single product we make, all of it, every bag, every single item. And we're not going to you know, cut any corners. We're going all out for it. I was very gratified to see this in the New York Times front page of the marketing section. That uh, Now, you guys probably won't think this is. I saw this farmer, and I saw this bag of Lay's kettle chips. I opened the, I'm on the plane. I opened the, opened the uh, newspaper and I go, oh, here we go, getting slammed on sodium again. And it turns out that the article is about our new campaign. We have an advertising campaign where we use our actual farmers, depending on what part of the country you're in, and they're showing that these products are grown from real potatoes, made with simple ingredients, and usually made within a day's shipment of your home. These products are grown in regions. That is our farmer in California. He's in all of our ads in California talking about the simple ingredients made with simple ingredients from the earth. And uh, it has done an enormous thing for our business. Our sales on Lay's brand is up double digit for three years in a row. And our marketing team came in to show me some new idea on a campaign. I said, absolutely not. Just run this ad so for another year because it's awfully successful. But what was really interesting in the article is this quote from Michael Jacobson, who's the head of the Center of Science and Public Interest. I call him a food terrorist. He hates us. 
he would like us to go out of business. One time he came to one of our meetings and he said, you should probably go into the entertainment business and get out of making snack foods. So that's the kind of relationship we had with him. Here he's quoted to say, it's a misconception that potato chips are a major source of sodium in the American diet. And he goes on later to talk about how what Frito-Lay is doing is really successful and really a good idea in reducing sodium and using all natural ingredients. And I had a meeting with him last Monday. The first meeting, I was ducking bullets the whole time. The second time, he said, interesting. This Friday, he said, you're to be congratulated for what you're doing, and I'm going to use you guys as an example to other companies on what they should do on the sodium issue. So that was a pretty big deal for us. Next, here's what we're doing next year. This is our All Naturals campaign, and we are going to launch our Lay's brand, which is a $2.5 billion business. We are taking out, we are putting in all natural ingredients and taking out all the artificial ingredients. 25% less sodium, no artificial colors, no MSG in the flavored products, no artificial preservatives, and it will be gluten-free. So this is a junk food product from five years ago, seven years ago, and this is what it'll be today. Is it health food? Absolutely not. But is it something that you could feel comfortable feeding your family and young moms and baby boomers who come back into the snacking business, eat this product with a sandwich? It's very safe. It's a good product. Then we're going to take this product, which is Tostitos. We have figured out how to add whole grains into the product. Both products will be a good source of whole grains, low in sodium, no artificial flavors, no MSG, all, no, all the preservatives are pulled out. This will be gluten-free. And these are two new products. One is a multi-grain scoop, and this one is an artisan recipe where we ground in black beans into the masa, and we take the sodium levels are down to 90 milligrams per serving. And these two products are about as healthy as you can get, and I could see these working very well with young mothers and baby boomers as well. Sun chips. Again, I'll, I'm not going to bore you through, through each one of these, but all natural ingredients, low sodium. This product has 18 grams of, of whole grains, and it's a good source of fiber. So you can see we're trying to change the image of these junk food snack brands so that consumers will be satisfied with them. And we're even going to add the multi-pack on, on the all natural campaign next year, which I think will be great for moms that are trying to pack lunches with healthy snacks. So, by this time next year, 50 to 60% of our entire line of products will be all natural ingredients, they'll have low sodium, and they'll be making su substantial gains in grains and fiber. So, and it doesn't taste any different. One of the students made a very important point, hey, with all the stuff you're talking about today, does this product taste good? And the answer is yes, it tastes exactly the same, and we've gone to great extremes to try to make that happen. And here's how the shelf will look, because we're going to put this whole look across all of the business, so the packaging is somewhat similar, and it'll cause a, a, a look on the shelf that is unique to the business. We will be gluten free, we're the largest gluten-free company in North America by this time next year, and the only products we make that won't be gluten-free will be two wheat-based products, which are sun chips and, and uh, pretzels. And we've gone into a business that is a healthier business, and we bought the Stacy's brand, which is a pita chip company. We have gone into a joint venture with Sabra Hummus, which is a wonderful product. And we just acquired a company called Santa Barbara Salsa, which has got, it's a refrigerated salsa with very healthy credentials, a uh, peach and mango salsa, and also vegetable salsas that are very good. And then we're even coming out this Sabra, by the way, their plant just opened up in Richmond. Uh, the Sabra product is now going to have a dairy-based product that we'll be launching next year, which is tzatziki dips and yogurt-based products, which I think will be considered much healthier than some of the other dips that are out there. So this is another installment in the plan to get towards being a healthier company. And we think it's very important for us to do this if we're going to have a good future. It costs some money, but I'm making a bet that if we do these things and don't increase the price to the consumer, I think our value goes up. And it separates us from the competition. And certainly private label, which is now in this tough economy gotten to be a bigger business, they're not going to be able to touch this stuff. They'll be far behind, and I, don't, I think we'll be able to separate ourselves. So that's a little bit of the marketing plan of attack on our products and trying to become all natural and trying to become healthier. And now I want to take you through the second plank, which is all about customers. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to tell you, even in this tough economy, we're still ranked the second fastest growing food company in America. That includes all the top 30 companies, top 20 companies. And you know what, tell you a little bit of what's going on in retail business. 
we were number two with a 2.1% growth. After number five, all of the companies are in negative territory this year. That means if you're the top sixth fastest growing company in America, in food stores today, your sales are below prior year. So that gives you an idea how tough this economy is and how much deflation is in the business. Um, we're ranked number two. We were ranked number one last year, and we were ranked number one the year before that. So I'm very proud of the results that our team's done. And this is a big deal for people like us. If one of your big customers votes you vendor of the year, it's a big celebration. Sam's Club, which is our second largest customer, and Target have uh, voted Frito-Lay the, the vendor of the year uh, for 2009. Now I want to talk to you about the environment, and I'll go through quickly because the students heard this and are probably tired of hearing about it. For those of you who didn't, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, our green strategy that goes from what we call seed to shelf. And this means that from the point of planting the product in the ground, the seed, all the way to the time it checks out at the register in the grocery store, we want to have a full look at how we make our products environmentally sustainable. So first step. We're working with our farmers. Two great moves with our farmers, taking potatoes and shipping them by rail car, not by truck. It's saving a ton of gas. The second thing is we have some of our forward-thinking farmers that are using some drip irrigation strategies instead of those big arms that you see irrigating the whole field, saving 70% of the water they use to irrigate the crop. Those are two programs that are in place right now. One of them, the rail car, is in full flight. The other one is being worked on because there are some capital investments required. This second one is shows a near net zero plant, Casa Grande, Arizona, starting in uh, January, will reopen. It's a 25-year-old plant. We will put solar panels. We've already put solar panels in the ground. We will get off the electricity grid. We have a biomass boiler that will grind up uh, yard waste and wood chips, and we will get off of 75% of the natural gas that we use. And finally, we are going to put a big membrane bioreactor in place, which will cycle, recycle 90% of the water that we use. So this plant only uses three real natural resources, natural gas, electricity, and uh, also water. We will almost be net zero. And that will be a big accomplishment. This is something we're going to put up in front of our consumers in Arizona, but we're also having each of our plant managers come through and take a look at this. And we're saying to each of the plant managers, I want you to go back and figure out how you can put a capital plan in place in the next five years to take your plant to almost near net zero. And I have seen some incredible creative work done by some of our plant managers almost near net zero with a couple of those plants without all the bells and whistles we gave the guys out in Casa Grande, Arizona. Sunchips packaging. This has been a little bit of an embarrassment. It's a noisy bag, right? Has anybody tried a sun chip in the noisy bag? All right, um, um, please, leave me alone. I've heard enough about this. My boss is all over me. Um, what a great idea that was, Carrie. That noisy bag. It's not a noisy bag. It's compostable. But so our people worked on this bag, and I'm really proud of them. Polylactic acid. It's made out of polylactic acid. It takes us out of a, a uh, petroleum-based substance, substrate, to make the product, and we put corn. Polylactic acid is corn, and we're making this bag with corn and it will degrade in 14 weeks, and it can compost. So we've got this product, these bags are in schools, kids are learning how to compost. The, in Canada, all families compost. You have three bins in Canada. Here we only have two. But uh, this has not been as great a strategy as I thought it would be. The damn bag makes so much noise <laughs> that I'm getting letters from consumers. You have woken my child up while I'm trying to eat this product. I'm thinking, really? I mean, this is not important. but. Uh, they think it's important. I've gotten about 50,000 letters on this, so I think it's important. But I've also gotten about 50,000 letters that say, I love what you're doing for the environment, and that's an awesome idea. So we're working on how you make a less noisy bag, but the really good idea, and this is one I'm proud of the R&D group, because by working on this compostable bag, we found a way to make a 100% biodegradable recyclable package and at a lower cost to our current packaging. So in about two years, somewhere in that range of 18 months to 24 months, we will have a, compo we will have a biodegradable, recyclable paper package on everything we make and all bags. And that was what we got out of the research that gave us the compostable bag. So if we hadn't leaned in on the technology and the investment, we would have never found this bigger idea 
But I have to tell you that when it showed up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, I said, no good deed goes unpunished. This is horrible. I mean, they made such a big deal about it. Then it was on the Today Show the next day. And on the, you know, the front page of the Wall Street Journal, please, excuse me, there's not anything more important to talk about than the noisy uh, Sunships bags. We had the damn guy who's, uh, he flies a jet fighter pilot, and he said that the noisy bag has more decibels than his jet pilot cockpit, and uh, you know, it's comparisons, and I'm thinking, this is not relevant. And uh, you're supposed to eat the product. We weren't suggesting you keep the product for forever, but it turns out that um, then Matt Lauer, fortunately, at one point after they were just dragging us through the mud, started eating the product, and then he said, hey, these are very good. And then he looks on the back of the bag, hey, these are healthy. So we got a free ad from, uh, from Matt Lauer on that. Thank God he looked at that bag. But anyway, that's our plan. That's our plan on the compostable, and I'm not afraid of saying we made a mistake. Who cares? I mean, how are you going to find out what the bigger ideas are unless you try some things? The fleet is a great strategy. You got this 20,000 trucks getting nine miles per gallon. That's a lot of fuel. We now have a truck that gets 18 miles per gallon. We just bought 2,200 of them this earlier this year. We now have a truck that we think we can get 30 miles per gallon. We got another truck that is all electric. And we can run 120 miles a day on this electric truck, and we think that we can use 2,000 of them. And uh, you know, talk about empowering your young people. Out in California, one group said, give us the electric trucks. We want the electric trucks. They're putting so, po uh, photovoltaics on the, on the roof of their distribution center. And we think we can get most of the energy to, re to replug and recharge the trucks out of the sun. And uh, it could be a really cool story if this works. I think you'll be able to get at least 50% of the energy you need. Last thing is, I'm real proud of this, um, LEED Gold Certified. Most of you who have uh, knowledge of the environmental sustainability programs know that this is a LEED Platinum is the ultimate. LEED Gold's right not next, then is LEED Silver, and I think there's a LEED, general LEED. Um, to get LEED Platinum, you almost have to start from ground up in a brand new uh, structure. But we have a 25-year-old headquarters corporate building in Plano, Texas, and we had to make some changes in retrofitting the uh, air conditioning system. And we now have the only uh, corporate headquarters in Texas that is LEED Gold certified. And we also have 11 plants in the field that are now LEED Gold certified. And our goal is to get this all the way through, except for a couple of our very old plants. So that's our story on environmental sustainability. But I got to tell you that when I first came back to Frito-Lay, and I went to our big marketing meeting. It was in Florida. All the marketers, a group about this size, young marketers, energetic. I'm giving my pitch. I'm expecting them to come rush the stage and ask me for more advertising dollars. Or why can't I have more innovation? Or why can't? Instead, they were all over this environmental sustainability piece. They think this young generation, you young people that are sitting here today, this is a big deal. I don't think any young people in America today are willing to have the environment treated the way it has in the past and want to do something positive for the environment, so much so that the research that we've done says that young consumers today will reward you if you have green products with their wallet. And if you're a leader in it, they're willing to pay a slight premium for this product because they want to do something about the earth. And I have four kids between 28 and 17, and I can tell you, this is a big deal. And they were laughing at the, the Sun Chips bag, believe me. I, I took a beating on that at home. But I will tell you that when I showed them the video on the work that we're doing, they were really, they were really impressed with it. So that's our story. And now I want to tell you about the most important part, which is inspiring greatness in others. This is about people. And here's my philosophy. I tried to explain this in the class today with my hands, and it wasn't working very good. But this is what I meant. Most companies have a model that looks like this on the left. CEO at the top, senior management works its way down. Most companies will have the CEO and the senior management decide what we're doing and then shove it down into the organization. Uh, Frito-Lay was like that about four years ago. Um, all decisions, for the most part, made in Plano, Texas with the senior staff. And what I noticed when I came back is the field people would come in, the junior people would come in and almost bow down to the altar at headquarters asking for permission to do stuff. And I realized pretty quickly that from a pragmatic standpoint, we don't even know what we're talking about in some of this stuff. The people low, closer to the action know what to do. So why are we making a decision on equipment for Southern California in Plano, Texas on a Friday afternoon? What do you think? If you're out in California, what do you guys think you ought to do managing your own P&L? So this is the direction we're trying to move in. 
I think we have tried to decide things at the center, and we're trying to solve regional problems on a national basis. It does not work. I've been around here long enough to see it. It does not work. This model, where you put the consumer and the customer at the top of the pyramid, and then the people closest to the action are the people that count. So when I talk to frontline employees in our company, those are the people that count the most. They're the most important people in the company, not me. I'm the lowest guy on the totem pole. My job is to remove obstacles and move resources around so that they can get their job done with the consumer and the customer. This is a decidedly different strategy for our company. I have had some negative feedback on it from some small group of people who think that this is not enough, that we don't have enough discipline and control in the organization for this to work. Well, I will tell you that you just take our results and compare them against the last few years. And it always works better when you give the 50,000 people a chance to own the performance and you empower 50,000 people to get the job done. You will always get better performance than if you're up at the top trying to do it on the left, where we're going to tell everybody what to do. There are very few times that that left-hand triangle works. The only time it works is if the people at the top know everything. Well, we, don't, we definitely don't know everything at Frito-Lay at the top. So I like this model. I've committed myself to it. And it's the way we operate now. And I'll tell you that in our organization, the frontline people in our company are the most important people. And I'll tell you a story about a couple of years ago, we ended up hitting a big bonus target. Everybody was going to get this. We hit the target. We were my first year on the job at, back at Frito. And uh, we decided to forego our executive extra bonus and gave the money to the frontline so they could get the full bonus. And you couldn't believe what the reaction was in our organization. But I wanted to send a strong signal to the people that they are the ones that count in the front line, not the people in the executive suites. You guys make plenty of money. You get stock options. You got bonuses and all the rest of this stuff. These guys on the front line are the ones that count, the ones that are making the product in the plant every day, the guys that are lugging the product from plant to plant and the over-the-road drivers and the f route salesmen who get up at 3.30 in the morning and deliver the product. They are the heroes of this company. They're the ones who built the company. And our job is to serve them, not to be served like some of the leadership teams have done in the past. So that's the philosophy that I manage with. And I will tell you that this works better than the other. Is it perfect? No. But if you had, some of your people kind of go off track. Your job as a leader is to pull them back on track. I mean, it, it, this is no big surprise. But the majority of our people are trying to do the right thing. And this works almost all the time. So one of the tools that we've used is the speed of trust in the Covey organization. I know you guys have an affiliation with Covey working on the seven habits. But this book has been a remarkable thing for me. And I, I ended up taking my team off site. And the lady in our organization kept saying, I want to do the speed of trust. This is really important for us to do with the new team. I kept saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just, then I, after she kept bugging me on it, I said, whenever your people are really passionate about something and you see them be that passionate, you got to let them go with it. So I let her bring the, this program to us at the off-site meeting. It was such a success that each of the functional leaders in my company all went off on their own and started rolling it out to their people. We brought our vendors in. And when you, the whole idea is when you have trust, there's actually a speed and an economics to the trust. And when you have trust, your team works better together. You can empower your people to go do the work. And it is a magical thing if you can do it right. And so what we're doing next year is I'm rolling out a program called Region Forward. We have 16 regions in the country with a region VP at each one with their own p and I am pulling a lot of the decision making and pushing it right into the field and letting them decide. So the rules I've used are, are when it comes to the p and and the customer, the field ought to make the decisions. When it comes to the strategy and the consumer, we're going to decide that back in headquarters. We're better equipped to deal with it. But it's a really good model. And you should see the reaction from the field leaders who really feel like they can own their business now. We'll roll this out, and I guarantee you 13 out of the 16 will do an extraordinary job with it. Three of them will kind of mess it up a little bit, and we'll have to fly in and help them. But uh, that's the plan. I'm not going to hold back a big idea because 10% of the group can't do it and wait until everybody can. We'll probably never get to a point where everybody's going to do it right. We're going to roll this out next year. And there's a lot of excitement in the field. And there's a lot of business opportunity we can get from this. So that's, uh, that's the story of where we're going. And I think it's very similar to where Dean Barrett is trying to lead this organization. It's based on a fundamental belief in people and that people can really make a difference. 
And when people are empowered, it really makes a difference in an organization. It makes technology work better. It makes everything work better. I'll just tell, in the last class, I, made, I, made, I told one story, and I'll end on this. Um, as you become a leader, as you graduate from school, and you take on your first couple of jobs, and then you get promoted to the first level, and you have your own team, I'd make one recommendation to you, and I'd ask you to maybe remember back, to, you know, 10 years from now, remember back to the old potato chip salesman that's on stage trying to tell you about this. The best way to build your business and to build your people is to have an optimistic leadership style. When you have an optimistic leadership style, people play offense. They don't play defense, especially in tough times like today. When you have an optimistic leadership style, you bring the best out of your people because they're going to take a shot rather than sit back and be careful and not risk. And when you bring the best out of your people, you build their confidence. If somebody asked me what is the number one thing I need to do at Frito-Lay with my people, it is build the confidence of the young people in this organization so that they could perform at levels way beyond they even thought they could perform at. I do not prescribe to this uh, fear, leadership by fear uh, strategy that I think is weak. I think if you can figure out how to build the confidence of the young people in the organization, that's what you want to do. And when you build the confidence in those folks, their performance is always better. Think about it. I don't care if you're talking about a baseball hitter. When they lose their confidence, they go into a slump. What happens when they get their confidence back? They get out of the slump. A young kid that's taken a math tutor, thinks he's not good at math, gets a tutor that really knows how to make them believe in themselves. All of a sudden, the kid's able to, get, to do math because their confidence went up. You take some young people in an organization like ours, 49,000 people, you start getting those young people to believe in themselves. You can't believe what happens. You start having people invent uh, photovoltaics for the roof of the car to, or the roof of the building to fuel up those uh, electric trucks. It's a remarkable thing. And I remember one of my bosses, and I think back, somebody asked me, when did your career really start taking off? I had one of my bosses say to me in a meeting one day when we had a whole group of 25 or 30 executives in the room. I was the lowest level person in the room. And uh, this guy, Roger Enrico, leaned over and said, Al, what do you think about this? Al, what do you think about it? He actually cared enough to ask me what I thought about it. And I answered him, and he ended up saying, that is exactly what we're going to do. And the whole group went off, and what I had recommended is what they were going to implement. Well, as I told the group that I met with today, I was wearing the same clothing I was wearing 60 seconds earlier. I'm sitting in the same chair I was sitting in 60 seconds earlier. But I believed in myself after that. The fact that this senior executive acknowledged my idea as being a good idea, good enough for the whole company to follow it, something turned on in my brain. It was a light bulb that said, I should expect more of myself. My confidence is higher. I'm not going to sit back anymore. I'm going to lean in, and I'm going to start taking a few risks. And it changed the whole mental frame that I approached my job with, and my career improved after that. And when I look around in my organization today and I see young people that are kind of leaning back a little bit in the room, but I know they're good and they're just needing a little, my job is to go find those people. Joe, what do you think about it? Those are magical words. I don't care if you're running a university, a little league baseball team, a $13 billion company. It's magic. It works. When you ask people, what do you think? All of a sudden, you've empowered them and you've given them a shot at showing what they can do and you build their confidence. So that's it. I just ask you to think about that. Building the people, your people's confidence will be the best thing you ever do if you're a leader in an organization. I just want to tell you, Paul, thank you very much. It's been an absolute delight to be able to be here. You worked my butt off today, <laughs> but I enjoyed it. Being in front of students who are so enthusiastic about their futures and to listen to an old timer like me tell a few stories, but it made me feel that if one student out of the 150 or so that I talked to gets one nugget out of what I was talking about, it would have been a worthwhile trip. I think Longwood is an absolute diamond in the rough. You told me not many people know about it. Not for long, folks. This is a great university. You have a great leader in the business school, and I love being here. So please invite me back again sometime. Thank you very much. We can take some questions. We have a microphone at each aisle. You'll have to come up front, but we want to take some uh, questions. Who has a question for Mr. Kerry? 
Remember, the only dumb question is the one you do not ask. Please the come up to the mic. The students are probably saying, no more. We've heard enough from him for one day. No, 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 no. There's a lot of students that haven't heard anything, and you just gave us a lot more. I just learned something. Uh, excuse my attire. Sorry. For, I had to do it for school. But <laughs> <laughs> all, all of these innovations that you're doing for the company, how is this going to affect your, the sales price, the revenues, and the expenses? That's yeah. what I was wondering. Good question. That's what my boss asked me. <laughs> you're, you're heading for big things. Um, the, I expect the revenues to go up by a couple of points in volume, in revenue. Our margins will hold even to what we're doing today because we've offset some of those investments with other cuts. And I've tried to bring uh, to our organization, you can't do everything. Our group loves to do everything. We had investments on 30 or 40 priorities, and I've cut it down to 10. And uh, that's the way we save the money to go do the things. We are not passing it along to the consumers at this point. We're going to see if we can't outfox our, cost, our competition a little bit and give consumers a lot of good things for a lower price. We'll see how it works. Questions? Come on down. Come on down. We want to make sure everybody hears the question. I like your outfit. And your outfit, too, better than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to work after this. Sorry. Um, I'm interested in the science aspect of how you're making things more healthy. And I noticed you mentioned a lot about the snack foods, but not so much about your drink products. Yep. So one of the, it's a good, great question, and it is probably on the top of the priority list in the corporation. So I got done presenting some of this material in a lot more detail to the board last week. They really were happy with where we're heading and the vision of where we're going is right on. The beverages are a different story for right now. Sugar will have to be reduced. We are working on it. We hired a man who is now our chief science officer, and he was the head of endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic. So when we brought him in, it's a whole different ball game. He is leading the charge on science and research to try to change all this stuff. We're looking at sweeteners, natural sweeteners. We're looking at cutting just cutting sugar out of the product, and we're looking at doing blends of different kinds of sweeteners, but you're absolutely, this is something that's going to have to happen. Otherwise, the beverage business will not grow. Uh, for example, one small move, Gatorade, we're taking all the high fructose corn syrup out of it next year. It's still got sugar in it, but it's all the high fructose corn syrup is gone. But this is a big priority. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm an active member of the FFA, so I was wondering how is Frito-Lay going to help support the small farm and agriculture education in America? Well, yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure. I, I wish somebody in our organization was here. I can tell you that the farmers we work with, we contract with these farmers, and uh, we do a big business with them, and these are small farmers and large farmers alike. But I don't know about, um, and we stick by these guys. A couple of years when the potato crop went down, they were really having a tough time. We paid a higher price above our contracted price to make sure they stayed up and stayed afloat. I don't know about the education piece, but I will find out and get you some information on it. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Questions? Here we go. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, when you flipped the pyramid, you know, from, you know, CEO on top to putting the consumers on top, how would you suggest for, like, other student organizations and stuff like that to start making those steps to switch, you know, like, changing from, you know, the older, you know, members to, like, the, the younger members, because they're obviously have more, like, new ideas and yeah. that kind of thing. I, listen, that's a, that's a great question. How to do it on the campus, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, when we started doing this, what you have to, you know, listening is a great thing. We went out and met with every constituent group, you know, the, the people lower in the organization and found out what we could, we interviewed them, asked them questions and surveyed it in depth. What could we do to help you become more successful? What obstacles could we get out of the way for you? And what kind of training do you need to do better? You should see the, the richness of data that we got out of them. You might start there. You might, uh, if you're leading one of the organizations, which I know you guys are, go down into the, the rank and file and find out what they think. And I think it could help you craft your story. And then you get that whole team wants to be part of it rather than just the people at the top that are leading the organization. Okay. Just Thank one you. idea. Come on. You guys are being really good. I know students would probably like to get out of here right now, right? <laughs> yeah. Hi. I just wanted to know what your favorite Frito-Lay product is. My favorite. <laughs> 
I love these Tostito scoops. But Dave, I think, uh, I think Stacy's with Sabra Hummus is, the, is number two on the list. I'll tell you a good one. If uh, out in the, our Latino market, we sell these third degree burn Doritos. They're so hot, the guys in the plant have to wear a mask when they're applying the seasoning. And we have a Pepsi Lime Max. And when you eat this hot product, you drink the lime. And lime soothes the, uh, the burn. So you can sell a lot of Pepsi and eat a lot of Doritos that way. <laughs> and I like that one. <laughs> Not taste-wise, I just like seeing what happens to the business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Other questions? Is that it? Okay, one. There we go. I want to know how, um, in the beginning of the, of the um, presentation, you, you was talking about how um, you wanted to change the whole junk food perception of the company. Yeah. So, in, like, the next five to ten years, where, where would you see the company being perceived in, like, the media and, like, consumers' minds, like, your perception of the company? Great. Thanks for that good question. Um, yeah, I think... What I hope to do, I mean, we're really starting out from a bad, you know, we've got a big hole to dig ourselves out of. The problem is as you make some of these changes, consumers don't totally believe you. So you've got to go tell the story in the media, to your point, advertising, print, social media is a very effective way to tell the story, block, working with our customers who have nutritionists to tell the story in the stores. But at some point in the future, I would hope people would say, Frito-Lay makes all natural products, they taste great, and they even have some products that are extraordinarily healthy for you. But we got a ways to go. I mean, we, you know, you go, we got a long way to go, but it can be done. All right, thank you. Thank you. You got another question? Another question coming down, coming down. Come on down. Um, I'm Taylor, and I first want to say that I'm a senior, and I would like to say that I'm highly employable, but <laughs> aside from that. <laughs> now, here's a good salesperson, right here. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> Um, but my question is, I understand that Frito-Lay is making strides in improving its diversity and its um, vision in the community. So could you speak to Longwood as, and give some pointers as to what, that, what you, we could do in looking at Frito-Lay as well? That's, uh, you know, so diversity is very important on our list of priorities. So I can give you an example. Um, um, in my senior team, I have 13 people report to me, and eight of the 13 are women or people of color. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed... Two things have happened since I have this more diverse team. Number one, what a collaborative group. They come from all different backgrounds and experiences, and the richness of those experiences help us make better decisions. There's no question about it. And then, as you go down into the rank and file, I think we do a very good job of representing African Americans, Asians, and Latinos in terms of the rank and file, but not at the, at the, the, the major management level. We have a lot of work to do in that area. Recruiting on college campuses is one of the best ways to do that, to get the pipeline full. Oh, imagine but, that. But we Look even <laughs> <laughs> You've reeled me in pretty good here, I would say. <laughs> but seriously, the, the, uh, an aggressive college campus program, because two-thirds of all college graduates last year were women or people of color. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, that's one source. The other thing is we probably have to go to the outside on the higher level folks and start making some strategic hires from other companies to get the ball rolling. What I have noticed at Frito-Lay, since we have uh, eight out of 13 diverse members of the senior team, the young people in our organization who are either African American or Latino or Asian, and they look up and they see someone running one mm -hmm. of the big organizations, now they believe they could get there. And until you make those moves, these young people don't believe it's true. So uh, it's a really important thing. I think first step, get your senior team to look like the community. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is build it with your, your college recruiting process all along the way. Okay. So I'll be getting your resume, I guess, in That's a few right. minutes. That's right. You'll be getting it <laughs> probably <laughs> by the end of the night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, how would you encourage uh, young entering level employees to get these new innovative ideas, such as um, the way you have your employees delegating you know, what they want to see happen in a corporation, into corporations that are run and managed by um, old blood, so to say, co companies that have their set ways and they don't want to look at things differently. It has to be done from the top. That's the problem. I mean, that's the challenge. Because if the senior leader doesn't buy in, uh, it really makes it tough. Because it, you, you almost have two standards. You know, there's the servant leadership model, and then there's this 
command and control model. The problem, if you don't get it changed at the top, the minute you have a problem in your business, and you will have problems all the time in your business. We have problems. Today I had a problem. But, but it's, uh, the, if you don't change it, you go back, you, you move to the command and control model as soon as trouble starts. You will have trouble. There is no question. If you're running a company, any small company, big company, you will have trouble. So you've really got to get it done at the top. And if the top's not willing to change, I wouldn't go to work for an organization like that. I, what I've noticed is in uh, my travels in college campuses, I don't think young people are interested in working in many command and control organizations. I think they want some level of empowerment. I think it's a trend of the future. I think there'll be more of this as time goes on. We're certainly not the only company. I've read books. I've, I'm following in the footsteps of people that went before me on this, but I hope that uh, this will be a trend of the future. And um, the only other thing I can tell you is some very good, persuasive young people selling the top level might also be able to change them, show them what you can do with results. Okay, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Any other questions? Pull the cord when you want me off. All yeah. right. Well, we got a limo to get you to, too. <laughs> All right. All right, we're going we're gonna to stop now. We have a, a couple gifts for you, Al. The first one is from our student organization that sponsored tonight's event, the Dean Student Advisory Board for the Business School. I'll let Mr. Brett do it. Thanks. On behalf of the uh, College of Business Economics, the Dean Student Advisory Board, and everyone here at Longwood, we'd like to thank you for coming and speaking with thank us. Thank you very much, night. Brett. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I happen to know that you are a uh, an athlete, and uh, had I was an athlete. A long well, time well, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> uh, you had the treadmill in the basement last yeah. night. I, I didn't see you get on it, but it, it was I there. I didn't get on it. We started this uh, a couple years ago. This is a gift for those important people like yourself, Al, that that uh, do a good job for us. So, what this is, uh, I asked Coach Buddy Balding for, who's been. Uh, the, actually, the the only baseball coach we've had, the longest standing, and the, and the baseball field was just named in his honor last year. Mm. has been a tremendous, tremendous influence at this university. I asked him, does he ever keep the home run baseballs? And he said, well, why? I said, well, if you do, I'd, I'd, I'd like a few of them. And I have one here for you tonight because basically what, I, what all of us are saying tonight is you really hit a home run for us today. This is actual home run baseball hit on March 19th, 09. And it was hit by uh, Longwood University student Jonathan Quigley. And for hitting a home run for us, we offer you a home oh, run geez. baseball from Longwood University. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you, brother. All right, man. Oh. And once again, I opened up with, I, I really meant it, I thought the most important people in the room tonight were the Longwood University students. And I'm going to tell you thank you to you guys as well for making this pro probably one of the most uh, populated uh, events I've seen on campus of this type. Certainly the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest uh, volume we've had for an executive residence that I'm aware of. And uh, so I say thank you to all of the, s the students that made this happen. But of course, I think it was mostly because of our speaker tonight who did a great job, Mr. Al Carey. Thank you all very much. Thank you.